Uh, next week, uh, we'll have uh, groups of presentations from the students in Texas. Uh, then uh, the Tuesday of the Thanksgiving week, we'll have uh, seven of you guys present. Uh, then we have the Thanksgiving break. Uh, we come back, uh, some Texas students present. Then we have a sort of split class with the remaining two and uh, five from Texas. And then we sort of finish off with the last week uh, students from Texas. So the schedules for all of those uh, should be posted. And I'm looking forward to uh, starting to learn from uh, you next week. Today, the topic is uh, water information uh, sharing and hydroshare, which uh, is not a surprise to use a topic uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, so this is a project that uh, I've been leading uh, to develop uh, collaborative data and model sharing capability uh, with the Consortium of Universities for Advancement of Hydrologic Science Incorporated, or KUHASI, um, for the last uh, five or six years. And uh, you all have a little bit of familiarity with it because you've put uh, your term projects in it. So uh, hopefully today we'll show you a bit of the thinking behind it and some of the additional uh, capability that it offers. I should note that uh, it wouldn't have happened without uh, your taxpayer dollars funding from the National Science Foundation. Um, and it wouldn't have happened without uh, the work of a large team of people who've uh, contributed various parts over many years. Um, so I said that uh, Kuhazi, so Kuhazi, uh, they, they say you should pronounce it Kuhazi. Uh, and it's a nonprofit. Uh, consortium of about 130 U.S. academic institutions, uh, some international universities. Uh, it's also open to private organizations. Its mission is to shape the future of hydrologic science by strengthening collaboration. And uh, the, the hope and anticipation and reason HydroShare is being built is to foster that collaboration, develop and deliver data, models, instrumentation, technology, promote education. So. Quasi uh, gets funding from NSF as well as uh, NOAA, Homeland Security, uh, FEMA, National Weather Service, uh, the Johnson Family Foundation, NASA, and William Penn. But the vast majority of the money comes from uh, NSF. And uh, HydroShare is one of the data and moral services that uh, Quasi supports. So this just uh, illustrates some of the programs that Quasi offers, and I thought I would uh, mention that because uh, some of you may want to uh, get involved in some of them. Um, so it's not only uh, data, data services or, high, or um, cyber infrastructure that uh, Quasi supports, but they also do a lot of uh, field work and measurement uh, type of work. We're going to be focusing on the, the data aspects of it today. Um, but here are some of the student opportunities. Um, you heard about the National Water Model and Dr. Maidman's visits to the National Water Center that really kicked off the concept of the um, Summer Institute. Uh, well, if you would like to go and spend uh, next summer in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, um, you can apply. Uh, applications open uh, just, it looks like, next week. Um, so. Uh, Consider that if you haven't got anything better to do in the summer. Or even, mm -hmm. I don't think what you could find better to do than that in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Kwasi also has uh, fellowships for graduate students to go and collaborate at other institutions. So uh, those are the Pathfinder fellowships. They have a series of cyber seminars where you can learn about a lot of subjects. Um, and also they are partly sponsoring uh, what's referred to as a Water Hack Week uh, next March at the University of Washington. So you could go uh, for five days uh, and do some intense uh, computer programming, hacking on some aspects of, uh, of water, if that's of interest to you. So um, the motivation for us to uh, do work on, on HydroShare is really collaborative research. The notion that advancing hydrologic understanding requires integration of information from multiple sources. Where have we heard that before? Um, GIS is really good at that. Uh, it requires using uh, diverse types of data and models. Um, it may be data and computationally intensive, um, and uh, therefore requires collaboration uh, and working as a team community. 
I sometimes think that uh, the days of uh, a single graduate student going out into the field and measuring one thing and making a truly uh, innovative discovery is probably getting fewer, but by working together, by bringing a lot of information, lots of lines of evidence to bear on uh, problems, I think that uh, we can actually uh, achieve uh, good progress in, in research. And then another motivation is that publication of data and models for transparency, reproducibility, and trust in their findings through the um, data being open and uh, transparent is becoming increasingly important. So um, we, we in hydrology have to work with uh, things like time series data, um, geographic features, geographic rasters, multidimensional space-time data. We work with models depicted with this sort of model builder workflow. Um, in HydroShare, we refer to all of these things as resources. And the word resource was chosen to represent an object that's not just data, but may include uh, models as well. Um, so collectively, I like to say hydrology is a team sport. We've all got to uh, work together um, in solving the important uh, grand challenges. Uh, so what's a grand challenge for uh, hydrology and water resource uh, researchers and engineers? Better forecasting uh, that quantifies the effects and consequences of uh, land surface change uh, and climate change on hydrologic processes and conditions by enabling access to and organizing data for integrated analysis and modeling. So the, this, uh, the part in blue is the sort of motivating uh, scientific uh, need. The part in black is the approach of using uh, computer systems, geographic information systems, cyber infrastructure, which is the sort of word that's used to represent all the information technology that we uh, bring together to be able to forecast and plan for and mitigate the effects of, of floods. Uh, it's not a happy situation when you're standing on your roof waiting to be rescued. Um, nor is it a happy situation when your reservoir looks uh, like that. And uh, that's happened in California in, uh, in recent years. Um, so part of the vision of what we're trying to, to build, and there's a lot of words on the slide, so uh, apologies for that. Um, but it's uh, an ecosystem of cyber infrastructure. That refers to uh, um, software systems, uh, data systems that uh, collectively form an ecosystem. You can think of uh, ArcGIS Pro and ArcGIS Online as separate components. Uh, HydroShare is another component. Uh, there's uh, Google Docs uh, that many of you will use uh, or different components. And to the extent that information can be transferred between those systems, uh, and you bring all of them together to uh, bear on solving a problem that we refer to as an, as an ecosystem of, uh, of elements that make up an integrated cyber infrastructure that lets you collaborate. You'll collaborate using email. You'll collaborate using uh, HydroShare. You'll collaborate using uh, Google Drive. Um, it lets you integrate data, data storage, data organization, discovery analysis, and modeling through web applications. We're moving much more into uh, a world where uh, we do things on the, on the internet. Uh, we like to overcome the limitations of what we're doing on our desktop. And when you're working with data on the internet, it becomes uh, much easier to collaborate and share with, uh, with other people. So you can take advantage of services beyond your desktop. The watershed delineation services we used uh, in ArcGIS Pro we're actually running in the, in the Esri cloud um, to make data storage and manipulation more reliable, scalable, while improving the ability to uh, collaborate and reproduce results. So some of the advantages of uh, moving to a sort of a web-based uh, computational platform is you don't need your own software. Um, you therefore don't have to uh, deal with installations, uh, libraries. You don't have to deal with, oh, it's a PC, oh, it's a Mac, oh, it's this. Uh, you do still have to deal with a little bit of the Chrome browser versus the Firefox browser, but the compatibility differences between browsers is a whole lot less than the compatibility differences between uh, Windows and Mac. Uh, you can uh, 
work with uh, large data as long as the servers can support that. It's easy to re reuse, reproducibility, transparency, so that you can, what you do can be systematically documented. Somebody else could uh, follow and uh, see, see the logic of your work and therefore uh, reproduce it and perhaps trust your findings uh, better. It's not uh, always ideal, and you, the climate scientists have uh, faced this problem in, in spades. Uh, they say, oh, we use this uh, XYZ climate model, and uh, the world is going to warm due to uh, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and people don't believe them. Uh, by actually exposing the logic of your scientific de deductions, uh, you can build up trust and uh, and then you can also collaborate. So that's some of the vision of uh, what we're trying to do. And uh, the picture here shows it's, it's sort of cloud-based, being on servers away from uh, your desktop. Uh, but uh, where you do analysis, you have your data housed, and you also have, have models. But uh, also importantly, there's people that are, are interacting and interacting with the data, interacting amongst themselves directly and interacting with the data. So um, one of the other things that's driving uh, work on cyber infrastructure is what I'm calling here the data deluge. And this is a slide set that was put together um, by Jeff Horsborough, where he was looking at uh, temperature data. And uh, if you have uh, sort of 15-minute uh, data, one day gives you uh, 96 observations. If you go to one week, 672 observations. A month, 2,800 observations. Um, a year, 35,000 observations. So for the data set that he was looking at, there were, uh, he had one and a half years, so it's 55,000 observations. And then you go to different sites, 14 sites, 26 variables, uh, because it's not only temperature you're measuring. You might be measuring humidity. You might be measuring precipitation, uh, things like that. Uh, at climate sites, in the data system he was looking at, which was for the, for the IUTOP project, measuring uh, uh, hydrologic and environmental information across the state of Utah, um, he had 14 climate sites with 74 variables. So that gets out to... 43 million data values. So you need some infrastructure to manage that. Uh, you've got the deluge, the wave coming in here. And uh, that's, uh, that's why we have to focus on some of this. There's also the challenge of uh, data heterogeneity. So this uh, slide, many of these pictures actually came from Dr. Mainman when we were working on the uh, hydrologic information system project. But you get data from dispersed federal agencies. Uh, in this class, you've seen data from the USGS, precipitation data from the National Climate Data Center, um, soils data from uh, the National Resources Conservation Service, uh, national land cover data. We heard a lot about census data. Um, they all use different uh, standards. Um, if it's from investigators, they've been collected for different purposes. Uh, they may not even align in terms of uh, how they are collected. We saw that census data was collected on census tracts, but if we're dealing with hydrology and watersheds, we like to work with catchments. Wouldn't it be nice if they made census tracts catchments? It would be great, but people didn't do that. So um, you have different formats, points, lines, polygons, fields, time series. Um, so the way that data is stored can enhance or inhibit what you can do with it. If it's uh, in a nice, organized way with, uh, say, a relational database that you know what the units are, you know uh, how frequently it's measured, uh, you can do analysis with it. But otherwise, you're uh, scrambling to try and interpret it. It becomes uh, difficult. So we need ways to organize the data we work with. That gets us into the concept of data models that we started the beginning of the class with. So this slide you've. Uh, Seen before, uh, Scott Moorhouse describing uh, the geographic data model uh, as a concept that underpins uh, ArcGIS. 
geographic information systems are built on formal models being a, an abstract and well-defined system of concepts. Uh, a geographic data model defines a vocabulary for describing and reasoning about things that are located on the Earth. So uh, things like uh, spatial reference, things like elevation um, are part of that uh, vocabulary. And they serve as a foundation on which uh, GIS is built. Um, you might be able to simply state it. The way that data is organized can enhance or inhibit the analysis that can, can be done. Or maybe you're like this. Uh, you're this poor lady uh, with all these papers, and uh, she has her, your, all your information right there, if only she can find it. So hopefully we, want, we don't want to be in this, uh, in this situation. Um, David, can you go back to the previous picture? Sure. So I used to work with a guy, and <clears throat> his papers built up on his desk so they were like over a foot deep. And then his chair, he put stuff on his chair, so his chair it sort of rose at the same rate as what his desk did. And yeah, he really, he lived like what you see in this picture. It's just amazing what you can do if you really put your mind to it. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, I have a colleague so, actually, out, yeah. of, out of our Center for Water Environment. His office is a, it's been videotaped. You know, he's got like stacks of books. You have to navigate through the stacks of books to actually get to his desk. And if you ask him for the tide records of Matagorda Bay in 1940, he can go, oh, yes, the tide records of Matagorda Bay in 19... It's, there it is. You know, it's just, yeah. Some people, that's the way they work, yeah. So I don't know whether that's good or not, but yeah. <laughs> we have, it takes, it takes, it takes every, all kinds to make the world. So this is another uh, slide that uh, I thought was quite insightful. Uh, came from Dr. Maidman early in the thinking about hydrologic information systems. And he made the statement uh, that it's, it's as important to represent hydrologic environments precisely with data as it is to represent hydrologic processes with equations. And um, so uh, if you think about it, a lot of our work in science has, has sort of been founded on physical laws, principles, mass, momentum, energy, the sort of things that uh, Newton came up with. And then if you translate that to hydrology, you have the equations of infiltration, the equations of uh, flow and open channels, the equations of uh, mass conservation. Um, but, uh, and, and the, a lot of times hydrology is, is just taught focusing on that, not really so much taught focusing on the data. But if you think of the information science side of things, a lot of the challenge with hydrology is not only understanding how the processes work, but also knowing the properties of the environment where they're occurring in. It doesn't really help me to know that uh, water flows in the subsurface according to Darcy's equation if I don't know what the hydraulic conductivity is. It doesn't help me to know about uh, Greenamp's equations for infiltration if I don't know uh, what the parameters involved are. And many times uh, those parameters are the things that's, that are hard to get. Maybe in terms of thinking about our work with uh, channels and hand, um, we have a lot of students, and I know there are students in this class who uh, are doing uh, hydraulics where uh, you learn uh, the, the nice, precise equations for flow in open channels, but unless you actually know the geometry of those open channels, that doesn't do you a lot of good. And oftentimes the open channels we're uh, dealing with in the world are complicated, and to try and, to try and actually get that information requires some information science uh, to do that, to bring all that information, the, the power of... Uh, to using our physical knowledge requires uh, um, describing the environment uh, very well. Um, and I thought this slide uh, kind of uh, crystallized for me the importance of uh, the, the data and the information in addition to the process understanding. So these are some of the data models that uh, uh, we have seen, and there's a few new ones there as well. Um, but uh, say top right is the, the data model that uh, actually underpins Arc Hydro. We just mentioned Arc Hydro in one of the classes, but we didn't get into a lot of details. That uh, looks at uh, variables as being 
uh, at a location in space at a point in time and being a certain variable. So if you think of, uh, you're looking at the velocity of flow in a river at a certain point in space at a certain point in time. Those are the three things you need to, uh, to describe that. So the arc hydro data model uh, basically built on, on those ideas and looked at uh, points uh, where, where quantities were measured. Um, if you're dealing with uh, continuous field-based information, um, there's actually a data format uh, referred to as NetCDF that's widely used in the atmospheric science uh, community that uh, lets you specify also the variables and the dimensions, the coordinate dimensions for space and time for arrays that we work with on the data. And I'll give a bit of an example uh, on that when I illustrate uh, um, HydroShare. Uh, without really making a big deal of it, when we've been doing uh, hydrologic terrain analysis and watershed delineation, we've started from the elevation data on a raw square grid. We've gone through the process of filling the sinks, calculating flow directions, perhaps using D8 or perhaps using D infinity, then calculating derived quantities such as uh, the catchments, such as where uh, stuff that originates in a particular place may go. So that's a terrain flow data model that enriches the information starting from uh, raw elevation data. Then what's shown here in text that's too small to read, thankfully, um, is uh, the Kohasi observations data model, which underpinned the uh, hydrologic information system, where we looked at what are the basic attributes associated with each single data value and how can they best be organized? You need to keep track of where it is in space, what the variable is, uh, what the units are, what time series it belongs to, uh, what, and, so, and so on. So there was a, um, a lot of work uh, elaborating uh, that out. Um, so then we might get to think, OK, how do people share other content? And um, if you've got videos, probably you share them on, on YouTube. Um, YouTube was actually a wonderful thing. Uh, prior to YouTube, it was practically impossible for me to uh, send any videos of uh, my children to my parents who were in South Africa. Um, even if I could, uh, well, I, I could uh, get a VHS tape and put it in the mail and send it to them. And they would get it a couple of weeks later, as long as the, the mail was reliable. Um, I could probably figure out, because I'm relatively computer savvy and I've got access to good computers, a way to get some sort of a computer representation of that file and put it on an FTP site. Do you think my mother could download it? Forget it. Um, <laughs> look at the, <laughs> do you think they've got the, working on, a, on, a, on an old modem, uh, internet connection, forget it. But this, the moment YouTube came along, and they said, well, even if they were able to get the file, then they've got to deal with the different formats. The moment YouTube came along, it solved all the problems because it'll take all the sort of commercially common formats, put it in YouTube, and then you just click and you see the video. It works. You can control who you share it with or not. You can add uh, captions to it uh, to uh, sort of annotate it uh, with, uh, with metadata. Similarly, Facebook and Instagram for photos, Dropbox perhaps for sharing files, Google Drive also for sharing files, ArcGIS Online for sharing maps. So the question then becomes, what should the go-to place be for hydrologic data? Do we need a, a special repository for hydrologic data? And I wouldn't really be uh, standing here asking that if uh, the answer wasn't that at least we thought the answer was yes, and we set about uh, building one working with uh, Kwasi because uh, Kwasi is effectively the community that's, that's trying to serve um, and that uh, motivated working on HydroShare. So HydroShare is a platform for sharing hydrologic resources, data and models as I mentioned before, and for collaborating. It provides you file storage and the Dropbox-ish like functionality. You can load stuff, you can make it public, somebody else can download it. Many of you have done that with your term project proposals and uh, progress reports. We would also like it to provide other functionality. 
provides metadata descriptions. With your term project, you had to enter keywords. You had to enter an abstract. You can actually uh, um, enter credits. If you said that you, your term project was funded by XYZ agency, you could have uh, given credits that way. You can actually programmatically access the information. Um, some of you will have seen the uh, web page that, that I put together that lists all the term projects. Do you think I went and typed those out by hand? I did. <laughs> I, I, there was no way that I was going to go and type those all out by hand or even cut and paste them. So I wrote a little script that took advantage of uh, the application programming interface in HydroShare that searched for all of the um, resources that had the keyword that you were instructed to use, GISWR 2018, and then it wrote out that uh, information in an HTML page. Um, there's web apps that can interact with uh, the data. There's social functions. You can sort of plus one something or you can rate something. And you can permanently publish something and get a citable digital object identifier. So that's some of the value added functionality that we've uh, tried to build. So here are a couple of examples. Um, so this is uh, work of um, some colleagues of mine. John Goodall is uh, on the HydroShare development team, and Jeff Sadler is a postdoc working with them. And uh, they went and published uh, this study that uh, was uh, data-driven methods for flood severity uh, using crowdsourced environmental data. They've got uh, predictions of flood reports, true numbers of flood reports. Um, and uh, the way that they, they, they've described this all in this uh, paper published in the Journal of Hydrology, and hopefully this will warm Dr. Maidman's heart because he was the editor of this uh, many years ago. Um, but uh, the part that uh, I wanted to draw attention to was uh, that they have included in the references citations to um, data sources, input data for flood severity modeling output data, output from a data-driven model of the flood severity modeling. And each of these is a digital object identifier link. And the hs.ff uh, and so on, those are the unique identifiers that are used in HydroShare. So if you click on these links, you get taken to the data in HydroShare that's supporting the transparency uh, of, this, uh, of this research. And it's the input data, the output data, as well as the scripts for doing, for doing the work. Another example is uh, the data from the 2017 hurricane. So uh, Hurricane Harvey and Irma were the sort of first two. And uh, we got a rapid grant from the National Science Foundation. So rapid is their mechanism for funding things. If there's an emergency and you want to do something quickly following that, uh, you can get uh, a small amount of money, uh, but awarded very quickly. Um, so we got uh, money to build up the Harvey and Irma collections. Another colleague got uh, money to look at uh, data from Hurricane Maria that's really impacted Puerto Rico. Um, and uh, you can go to HydroShare. You can click on the Collaborate tab. You can find the, uh, the data community group. Or you can look for the keywords Harvey, Irma, or Maria 2017 and find uh, data that has been assembled to sort of further study of, of these, uh, these events. Um, so data management. Um, some of you probably didn't necessarily come to graduate school to do, do data management. You came to graduate school to do something else, to do whatever it is your, your topic in hydrologic research or transportation research. But uh, Many of the professors that have funded you will have put statements in their proposals that say things like, the primary data sets collected as part of this project will be made free and publicly available. Um, and uh, this was from the IUTAR data management plan. Um, how is that going to be accomplished? So this is how it, perhaps it should work. You should create a digital instance of the data set or model quickly share it with colleagues, perhaps privately at first. Um, add value through collaboration. So person A collects the data, person B then uh, cleans up the data, works on it, does some further analysis, and records information about that. 
describing it with metadata. Then eventually you share it publicly, you get a digital object identifier, you publish your paper, and the work is uh, citable um, and uh, reproducible. I don't think that's necessarily a very easy thing to do. Um, so uh, what we're trying to help with is uh, have the tools to make that a little bit easier. So HydroShare gives you a way to share data sets and models and research projects. It's got some capabilities for collaboration, has links to computational resources, and I'll show you some of those, provides permanent publication of data and models with DOIs. Um, and this on the right just gives you an illustration. T.W. Daniels Experimental Forest is uh, a site up uh, in Logan Canyon where um, there was some LIDAR data collected and uh, Michaela Tich was the um, postdoc working on organizing that data and I helped uh, get this in information into, into HydroShare. So this LIDAR data is now, um, is now preserved uh, for, uh, for posterity and it has a digital object identifier. So overall it's a system to try and advance hydrologic science by enabling the community to more easily follow the best practices of, of modern science sharing results from their research, not just the paper, but also the data and models used to create it. That's being really strongly promoted by American Geophysical Union, AGU, and other um, scientific uh, organizations under what they call the FAIR data principles, making data FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. I got this email today, so this was actually pretty timely. Well, I, um, so uh, when I got up this morning, it was in my email box from Copernicus Publications. So this is uh, the organization that publishes uh, the European Geophysical Union uh, journals such as Hydrology and Earth System Science uh, and many others. The subject, Enabling Fair Data, Updates to Data Policy and Author Guidelines. Dear authors, Scholars should receive credit and recognition for producing data, developing new techniques and algorithms, providing key samples, and generating other non-textual research assets. So it's kind of long and fine print. In order to facilitate this, data and other materials underpinning the findings presented in your publication should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable, not only for humans, but also for machines. There's actually a presidential directive uh, from Obama in about 2010, I think, that uh, talks about uh, human and uh, machine readable. And uh, I like to cite that because how often can you cite a, a president in your, uh, in your work? Um, so according to these principles, data should at the very least have uh, unique and persistent identifiers uh, and appropriate metadata to assist discovery and be cited in a form equivalent to other scholarly outputs. Therefore, you are requested to make research outputs fair and, wherever possible, open by depositing research outputs, e.g. data, software, in a trustworthy, community-accepted, fair-aligned repositories that support the following. It talks about things it should be. You can find suitable repository for your data by going to that link, and it goes on. You can read the details um, and the policy. So if you go to that link, you'll find HydroShare if you search for hydrology. And so HydroShare, part of, operated by Quasi, is available as part of this system to try and uh, support, uh, support fair data. So um, the data we're working with are uh, diverse time series, geographic rasters, geographic features, multi-dimensional space, time, model programs, and model instances. So when we were thinking about how to organize information in HydroShare, we had to think, how are we going to uh, have a system that can include all this sort of data and support ways to organize it? We didn't necessarily get it right first, and we've sort of gone through a morph of the way we organize things and the way we organizing uh, resources now has uh, sort of transformed from what we started off with. Um, but to try and do it in a, in a formal and structured way, we adopted uh, this uh, 
thing that's called the Open Archives Initiative Object Reuse and Exchange Standards uh, Based Resource Data Model that uh, keeps things uh, like for every document, uh, it has unique identifiers. It says when it was created, DC terms means this is a part of Dublin Core uh, metadata. So uh, if you use metadata that's uh, that follows a standard and you define it in terms of a what's referred to as a vocabulary, the DC terms, then machine readability uh, is enhanced. Um, so there's the resource app document, there's aggregations that can group uh, different content types together, there's resource level metadata documents, there's content data files, um, and they're all sort of organized and described in this uh, in this paper that Jeff Horsburgh uh, first authored. Um, so here are some of the things that uh, you can do. You can go, you can add your content to HydroShare, create a new resource. Uh, then uh, for each resource, you can manage who has access to it, either to be able to edit it or to view it. You can comment or rate it. Uh, you can obtain unique identifiers. You can edit the metadata. You can organize it into collections. Um, you can permanently publish with a DOI. You can create new versions if uh, there's a new version. Of course, once you've permanently published something, you can no longer change it. So if you then come out with a new version, you have to keep the old version and the new version that points back to the old one. And you can work on it with web apps. So that's one of, one of the things we've been trying to emphasize is make a system that allows you to do useful things immediately uh, and provide an incentive that is beyond just uh, the fact that it's the right thing to do to share your data because it's actually hard to organize your data um, to, uh, to support sharing. But try and make it immediately useful. This is a little bit about uh, how resources can be organized. So a resource can hold multiple aggregations, an aggregation being a logical grouping of files Think of it in aggregation as a, a shapefile. A shapefile has a minimum of three files, but may have uh, many that represents a geographic feature. Those all need to get uh, grouped together. You also have multidimensional files that are NetCDF files. You can have grids represented by multiple files. Um, they're managed as one uh, discoverable object with one set of access controls, one unique identifier, and one set of resource level metadata. In other words, one abstract, one uh, set of authors, and so on. Then you can make a collection which can hold multiple resources. And collections and their members may each be discovered separately. You can also put keywords uh, and tags. And when I was preparing the slide, I was doing it for a um, NSF webinar. So Office of Advanced Cyber Infrastructure webinar was the keyword that I put on the slide set. You guys were using the keyword. GISWR 2018 that uh, allowed just resources that have been tagged with that keyword, that becomes a sort of a voluntary uh, joining of a collection. If you put a unique keyword on it, um, then uh, somebody searching on that will find all of those, those resources. Um, we've tried to make uh, metadata collection uh, either not necessary or uh, simple and automatic. So for example, if you load a geographic raster, the system will uh, automatically detect uh, things like the coordinate reference system um, and uh, put the spatial coverage information on the map. Um, if you use multidimensional data, it will also do a lot for you fairly automatically. Then there's apps that can act on the resources to support things like web-based visualization, the Hiroshi GIS app, which is a very simple uh, visualization of some GIS data sets. The Jupyter Hub app, which uh, allows you to work with, uh, with data. There's an app for accessing the national water model forecasts, as well as some NASA um, land data simulation um, data set. And there's, there's other apps as well. I was just highlighting those four. So the conceptual organization behind this is, so this is kind of getting into the uh, technical details of this. But I wanted to give you guys a bit of a sense of a system like this just doesn't happen overnight. It takes a, quite a lot of thinking to 
say, how, how is it going to be, uh, be put together? It's founded on um, software referred to as IRODS, which is the integrated resource, uh, what is IRODS then? Resource-oriented data system. Uh, I've gone blank on what IRODS means. Yeah, um, sounds good. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, it, it, uh, it effectively allows you to have different data stores that could be on different computers and present them in a seamless uh, way uh, across the, the internet. Um, so that's distributed file storage. You can think of that as the multiple hard disks on your PC, but now scaled up to be uh, on the internet. There's a Django website. That's what you were actually interacting with. Django's uh, the Python framework that's used to, to encode it. Um, and that uh, builds the, the interface with you. And you can think of that as resource exploration. That's where you go and enter metadata. You um, work with your resources. You can manage the access. Then you've got apps, which provide action on it. So that's the web software to operate on the contents you have. Um, and that's where extensibility comes. And one thing that I like to uh, think of this, this is not that different from a personal computer. You've got one or more hard disks. You have the file browser that allows you to find the files on your computer. And uh, then you have programs that may be installed with the system, maybe that you buy a third party, ArcGIS Pro is one of them, that can act on the files and do all sorts of wonderful stuff. And some people, everybody will have their own different set of programs. You'll have ArcGIS, you'll have Microsoft Word, you'll have Excel. Uh, and as you add more apps, you can do more things. Um, so uh, in this context, uh, anybody can set up a server or an app platform to operate on HydroShare resources through iRODs and through the, through the API. So uh, we hope that there can be extensibility to the system by us not having to build everything, you don't expect uh, your PC manufacturer to sell you your computer with all the software you need. You just you get a computer with some basic set of software, but then you go out and you buy the specific software that you, uh, you want. So that's moving towards a sort of fully web-based um, hydrologic innovation environment. If we can get uh, this sort of organization happening uh, for data that's stored in HydroShare. So this talks a little bit about uh, the web app uh, linkage. So uh, to be able to allow people to launch effectively what's any website from a resource in HydroShare, uh, you can create a uh, web app resource instance using the web app resource type. And here's illustrated three web apps, web app one, web app two, web app three, that each has metadata. Um, and then you have uh, different third-party websites that actually implement code that does whatever the function of that is. And we're in, when you're in HydroShare, you can launch, you can open a resource with a web app. It'll go to that third-party website and pass information to that third-party website, such as the unique identifier and credentials to access that resource. Then that third-party website does whatever it's been programmed to do. Um, so there's uh, launch parameters and some examples. So here you're opening the HydroShare GIS web app and you're passing a resource identifier. Or you're opening the SwatShare app that's hosted at mygeohub.org, which is at Purdue, and you're uh, working with a SWAT resource. Um, so the app that we'll work with a little bit is uh, Jupyter Hub. So you can open Jupyter Hub. You can get a hydrogen terrain analysis notebook. Uh, then you can write and execute code in that um, and uh, share your terrain analysis with them. So we'll, uh, we'll work through that. But there's, uh, you've got little snippets of Python code. You've got uh, digital elevation model files. And you've got visualizations of things like the D8 flow direction and D8 uh, slope. So enough talking. Let me go and uh, see what I can show you. Um, so here is HydroShare, and without logging in, I can go to the Discover tab and discover any information in HydroShare that's been 
uh, made uh, public. So you start off with just uh, an initial listing. You can switch over here to a uh, map-based view. The map-based view is uh, struggling a little bit in the sense that uh, we haven't really come up with a good design that uh, gives you a way to sort of depict the spatial coverages of all of the data available in an, in an easy way, because you've got some data sets that cover the whole world and some data sets that are, that are very localized. So there's an opportunity for somebody who uh, wants to go to the Water Hack Week in Washington, D.C. to maybe come up with a, a new way of discovering uh, map-based data. Um, let me go back to the list format and uh, let me look for uh, what data I can find in Logan. So uh, I just typed that keyword. So now it's finding everything that uh, had Logan either as a subject keyword or freeform text in the metadata fields that are searched, things like the abstract and the title, um, the authors. It's, uh, you'd probably, have, if there was an author named Logan, you might have found them too. Um, let's uh, filter by things that are owned by me. I guess Logan, there's a lot of, because uh, a lot of students here have worked on how to share, uh, Logan is not a very uh, discerning query. Um, but if I look for the things that, uh, that I've created, you can see um, there's a number of uh, digital elevation models. Uh, and these, uh, these different symbols here give you information on the, the type of the resource that you're dealing with. So uh, this uh, symbol is the collection symbol, and you can discover that by hovering over it and telling it's a collection. So if I was, if I was to look at this... Uh, resource, Logan River Geography, you'll get into uh, what's now referred to as the resource landing page for uh, this particular collection. It says it was authored by me. I'm the owner. There's a distinction between the authors and the owners. The owner is the person whose account on HydroShare was actually used to enter the information in, and they're managing it. The author is the person who... Uh, was the sort of intellectual creator of whatever that thing is. And uh, the, the author may be somebody who may not even have a HydroShare account, but you still want to recognize them for the sort of intellectual authorship of the content. Many times they're the same, but uh, we do allow that uh, distinction. Uh, you can see there there's uh, subject keywords. Um, you can see the information such as the spatial coverage of this uh, this collection, um, and uh, it's got a, a number of uh, member resources, the Logan Digital Elevation Model, Logan Specific Catchment Area, and the Logan uh, Stream Network. So if I go into, uh, and it says two of them are, are published, so these two will have uh, digital object identifiers associated with them, and this uh, third one is not uh, not formally published or permanently published, but it's still uh, public. Um, so let me go into the, the digital elevation model one. And uh, here you see that there's the unique digital object identifier given for this. Uh, this how to cite link says that if you want to cite this in a paper, you cite it that way. Um, it's formally published. Uh, it also has that sort of spatial coverage information. There's two files involved in this. The, one is the actual TIFF file, a GeoTIFF file that is the DEM. And because we chose to use a format uh, that allows many files to be assembled into one raster, there's a, that's referred to as the GDAL virtual raster tile format, or VRT. There's a little VRT file that gets created when you um, add a TIFF file to, um, to HydroShare. You can then see down here things like the authorship in related resources. You can see that this is data for. Um, so uh, this is now a reference. And if I was to follow this link, that would take me to the specific catchment area resource. So that says, so we've now got sort of forward and backward links that are relating data. This, um, this, is, uh, this is data for another HydroShare resource that was 
that was advanced uh, information. It was derived from the National Innovation data sets, um, and it belongs to the collection that I made, and then there was another one that's Liza Brazil, who's one of the quasi, uh, um, one of the quasi people ha has made also using the, this resource. Um, so those are some of the things that uh, you, can, uh, you can see. Notice also there's uh, things like, um, well, you can look at the resource specific information. It'll give the, um, the, uh, the projection information, the extent in the UTM zone 12, it'll give you the cell information, uh, it'll give you the band information. So we've actually added the capability to put a variable and units on each band. So typically if you just get a, a raster file from GIS, you may not know what it is. We thought at least people should be able to say this is elevation measured in, in meters and uh, what's the method uh, used to, um, to come up with it. Um, so um, there's also uh, a lic licensing information. Uh, so this says if you download this, what your responsibility is in terms of uh, giving the, the owner credit. Uh, should it, so this is a Creative Commons license. It means anybody else uh, can uh, use it, um, and they should really just uh, give attribution to, uh, to the developer. Um, there's also a place here that says download all content as a zipped bagged archive. Now that's a piece of jargon that uh, we get a lot of trouble with because nobody knows uh, really what that is. Um, but this is part of the formal uh, way we're trying to uh, describe the metadata and make everything machine readable. So if I download that, um, I will, uh, so it says it's preparing the way to, waiting for the down, Wait for the download to be prepared, uh, and then it lets me save a file. Notice the file name is B782278. So it's named for the unique identifier of the resource. Um, if I go to uh, wherever the downloads are on the computer, now I've got this file. If I extract uh, the contents, um, and then I look inside, I'll see that there's a, uh, a data folder, and then there's folders that are related to uh, the Bagot format. If you open the README folder, it explains, uh, it explains the structure. It contains resources in a Bagot format. It explains a bit about the, uh, the data contents. It says where you can get the specification. Um, and let me get this uh, wrapping a bit better. Um, and uh, it's used by a number of organizations, including uh, the US Library of Congress. So there's a little bit of uh, credibility behind uh, adopting this as a, as a, as a standard. Um, and then, it, then these bigger text and manifest files and tag manifest files are really just uh, check some type information to make sure that the data hasn't been corrupted along the way. Then you can go into the, the data and inside of contents, you'll actually see the uh, three files involved, or the files involved, the Logan TIFF file and its, its associated VRT file. And outside, you see the resource map and the resource metadata. So if I'm to open that, and a good thing to open it with is probably some sort of a browser, you can see the, the metadata, in this case in XML format, or for this resource. It's got things like the, the title, uh, that it's a raster resource. This is the abstract for it. Uh, this is information about the, the creator, my contact information, uh, the coverage, uh, so things like uh, the north limit, south limit, east limit, west limit, and the units. So it can all be sort of unambiguously uh, interpreted. So let's uh, go back here um, and let me look at the, the stream network. So uh, this is a, a geographic feature type resource. Um, notice it doesn't have a DOI on it because it hasn't been permanently published. Um, 
It also has a spatial coverage. And you see all of the bits and pieces of, of a shapefile here. So you would recognize this is a shapefile. One of the things we can actually do with this is this open with HydroShare GIS. Um, and now it'll uh, launch um, into uh, the app environment that requires that I log in. So I was not logged in before. So I was doing everything I could as a public. To actually work with apps, you need to be, uh, to be logged in. So um, there we get a, a basic uh, sort of GIS. I can put um, a base map on it. And the, you can see the, the shape file for the Logan River was shared there um, in this uh, sort of base map format. So this is a fairly, this is intended really not to be sort of fully fledged GIS functionality, but just sort of quick uh, viewing of some of the information uh, that then you might have to, uh, might pull in for, uh, for uh, further, further analysis. David? I'm going to show. Uh, David, can I ask a question? Go ahead. That, that's a really yes. cool hillshade map there. Where did that come from? Um, so that came from the, this base map, which uh, is probably um, an open layers uh, base map. So this, this HydroShare GIS app uh, was developed by Dan Ames and his students at BYU. And you've got the choice of these. And I'm not, yeah, I, I think it's just one of this. The standard, fairly commonly available, uh, well, let's see if this I will tell me, maybe. Attributions. Bing. So it's a Microsoft uh, map. So it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a Microsoft based map that um, they're making uh, available for anybody to, to use. Um, so now I'm going to go back. Uh, so let me close that. Um, and uh, because I'm now logged into HydroShare, I can uh, get a listing of, uh, of my resources. Um, it actually gave me a message saying I'd successfully logged in because I logged in when I was going to the, to the map. Um, so these are other things that I've uh, created in this, in this account for various other and the demos and the like. This is an account I use for, for doing uh, so software demos like this class. I'm going to click on this Create New to um, uh, add a resource. And I'm going to go to this file that I uh, found uh, or that I, um, I downloaded before the class, HydroShare Demo Data. So here we've got um, one NetCDF file. We've got a, all the pieces of a shape file and a TIFF file. So uh, let, I'm going to show you what happens if I create a resource out of a NetCDF file. So who's actually done anything with a NetCDF file ever in your life before? We have two. Few people. Two. How, how many others were there in Texas? Two. Was it only you? No. OK, and there was one. <laughs> Emily Peace, also from USGS. OK. So, um, so it's a format that uh, was really created by uh, UniData, which is part of the university's consortium of, for atmospheric research, uh, widely used in uh, the atmospheric science field. And this happens to be snow water equivalent uh, for uh, a snowmelt model run over the Logan watershed by one of my students. But watch what happens. I mean, when you guys created resources and you did something like this, you then had to go and add additional information. I'm going to just uh, go here, click the Create Resource button. So now it's going to uh, be uploaded. And um, because this is a NetCDF file, um, HydroShare recognizes, HydroShare uses NetCDF files as the format for multidimensional data. It uh, can, can read that. Because NetCDF files are quite a rich data format and allow you to put things like title, abstract, authors in the file, HydroShare will read those out. And you'll see that my resource was created with a title already. So that came from the NetCDF file. 
So this is where we're trying to make it easy for users. Um, it's already got keywords. It's already got an abstract. Um, uh, you see the standard citation information. Because I was the person doing it, it put me as the, the author. It also appended the name of the student that was, was in the file. Um, it's got spatial coverage information. It's also got temporal coverage information. And it's showing the, uh, this as a, what's, what we call in the sort of jargon of HydroShare, a multidimensional content uh, aggregation. And if I click on that, I can go and see, for example, the content metadata. And um, there is spatial reference information. Uh, there's also temporal coverage information. The variables that are recorded, such as the time, the um, spatial reference information, snow water equivalent, and the x and y. And then there's the standard NetCDF header file that those of you familiar with NetCDF would be uh, really familiar with. Um, you can actually double click on this and uh, you'll go in and you'll see that it's got uh, the NetEDF file I uploaded and it also created the header file to, uh, to show that uh, metadata information. So uh, because this one, HydroShare has a requirement that you have to have metadata completed before a resource can be made public, such as things like the title and the abstract. I know some of you with a term project had trouble with actually getting all the information needed to uh, make your resources public. Once you've got all the information, you can make it public. It so happens that uh, once a NetCDF resource is uh, public, it can be accessed through another app, the OpenDAP uh, server that um, is, uh, is part of HydroShare. And uh, I can right click on it and say, use the, the OpenDAP app. And that'll take me into, uh, well, let me just do it. Um, it takes me to a, uh, a different website, hyrex.hydroshare.org, that's running uh, software that exposes uh, NetCDF uh, data. So now you're seeing the global attributes of it, the <coughs> time attributes of it. And this allows you, this, this, is, uh, this may not lo look all that exciting, and it's not necessarily all that elegantly formatted, but for people who are familiar with working with uh, NetCDF files, this allows them to then subset information out of it. So you may have a large NetCDF file that spans the whole continental US, such as perhaps with the national water model output, and you want to just uh, subset a small piece. This is the sort of capability that uh, could provide that. And um, I didn't do the demo with any of the national water model files because we haven't got those sort of fully hooked up to uh, work with this sort of a server um, yet. Um, but that's sort of part of the work in progress that we're trying to do to en enhance access to that data to allow people to work with it, with it more efficiently. So let me also um, create another resource um, from uh, our digital elevation model data. So let me uh, create a new resource again. And I'm, what I'm leading to is I'm going to actually show you how to do uh, essentially exercise four using uh, one of the, using sort of Taudim functionality within, uh, within the Jupyter um, notebook app. You don't actually have to load files immediately. I could just uh, click create resource and then I end up with um, an empty resource. So here I've got a so it says, congratulations, I've created a resource, but it doesn't have a title yet, doesn't have abstract, doesn't have keywords, doesn't have anything yet. I'll switch it into edit mode. So uh, now I'm in the mode where I can uh, give it a title, Logan uh, Watershed. Um, let's call it uh, in class Logan watershed analysis, remember to save the changes, um, and maybe uh, GISWR2018, if I want to think of it as associated with this, with this class. 
Um, now maybe I want to add some, some data. So let me go to where I had this demo data here and pick my uh, shape file and uh, let me just uh, drag and drop. So now I'm loading all of the files associated with a, with a shape file into this, uh, this resource. And um, once, it, once it uploads, this is actually taking the data from my local PC into the IROD server at UNC Chapel Hill in the Renaissance Computing uh, Institute that's hosting HydroShare. Um, and it's also passing the shapefile to get things like the spatial coverage information and uh, populate initial metadata. So now I think it's done you will see that it's created a, uh, a dot on the map, which is uh, the spatial coverage information for that. And it took all of those files and put them in uh, a symbolized folder that effectively represents the uh, geographic feature content object. I can double click on it and I can see the individual shape files there, but uh, outside I'm just seeing it as um, a single geographic feature. So this is part of the transition that we're in the midst of with, uh, with HydroShare moving to where uh, we have content aggregations within a single resource that can have different types rather than having to have uh, separate resources for each, uh, each different type. Let me also load um, the Logan GeoTIFF file. Um, so uh, now it's uploading that. And uh, because it recognizes a GeoTIFF file as, as a geographic raster, it will also create for me a uh, geographic raster content object that will be symbolized uh, in the space there. So uh, now we've got the geographic raster content, so a different symbol. I can go inside it, and there's the TIFF file that I had, as well as the VRT file that I, that's associated with the virtual raster tiling format that's, that's being uh, used. I could put those in a folder if I wanted to, if I wanted to add other things and try and, try and organize the information. Um, notice each of these has their own uh, spatial uh, reference information. So if I look at the, if I click on the GeoTIFF file, and I go down to where it says content metadata, I can see that uh, um, it says, and I'm not quite sure why it's got uh, the content type as, um, as point rather than box. So maybe something's not working perfectly smoothly. Uh, no, this is still a, this is still a, sh this is showing information for the shape file. Uh, okay, that's because I was clicked on the shape file. If I click on the digital elevation model, I will see that in the content metadata area, it's showing me the, the bounding box information for that. And uh, this many rows and this many columns, cell size is 10 meters, and it's got band information. I could uh, call the band, uh, well, I could say the band, this is actually elevation and the units are meters and this is information that I could actually save for that. Um, I could save for this, uh, for this raster because a GeoTIFF file doesn't keep track of the fact of what it is. Um, I can also go and say set the spatial coverage for the resource from that raster and now it will show me the box rather than just a point. Um, hopefully the point was somewhere near the outlet in there. Um, what I did also want to do was show you some some analysis, and let me see if I can, I'm getting kind of short on time, so I'll just uh, quickly show how that starts, and then um, if any of you want, if, if any of you want to uh, explore that uh, yourself, uh, you can. So let me go back to, um, uh, I'm going to discover, and I'm going to look for uh, 
um, a GIS WR2018 because I, uh, I put this tag on it so I knew I'd be able to find it very easily. And I'm going to sort by uh, the date created in the descending order. So uh, once it's... Um, so this is the um, Taudem demo and tutorial watershed and stream network hide above nearest drainage uh, Jupyter notebook. So I'm going to open that. Um, this is a resource that uh, I created uh, yesterday. Well, I actually worked, I updated it yesterday and created a new one sort of targeted for this class um, that you can read what it is there. Uh, you'll see it contains just a single uh, notebook file. By the fact that it's got a Python notebook file in it, I can open it with uh, the Jupyter Hub app. So I learned that uh, we don't have perfect security here. So I'm going to say uh, I'm going to add this exception. And this is actually a little bit annoying, and I need to tell folks to, uh, to fix that. Uh, you tell me. Uh, so. Uh, so, um, I might have to do this again. So, advanced, add this exception, confirm security exception. Okay, so then I, I get to uh, sign in with HydraShare. So now this is again an example of where I'm moving from the HydroShare Django website into a third-party app actually hosted by uh, Kohazi. Um, and I, I can see the, it, it opens, immediately it opens for me a welcome notebook that allows me to do a number of things. And of course, I'm short of time. I'm not going to uh, do it all. I'm just going to say how to connect with HydroShare and you have to run each cell by basically uh, shift uh, enter on that, enter my password, um, and uh, then get the resource identifier for the resource I was working with, then retrieve its contents. And now you see I've actually downloaded the Python notebook that I got from my resource. So if I open that, this is the thing that I created and shared with you that was in, in this resource. And now I'm executing it on this web app. And it describes how to work with, with Taudim. It tells you that you have to import a number of utilities. Uh, you can worry about uh, the directories you're working in. And I'm not going to take the time to explain that all. You can get the contents from your resource. And we have to actually go back to uh, the resource that we've got, enter the unique identifier in there, get the contents. And um, then I'm going to just uh, plot, plot it. Um, and uh, once the plot comes up, I'm going to uh, declare victory on the analysis, pointing out that there's instructions given here for running through the sequence of functions that uh, you, uh, you've seen before. Things like, OK, so there we've got the, uh, the plot that shows us the DEM now in this, uh, in this uh, Jupyter environment. You can go through pit remove. You can say what the outlet is. You can go through and. Um, then do contributing area, uh, or D8 flow directions, contributing area, a threshold to define streams, map the streams, and uh, you can actually save the results back to HydroShare. And at the bottom, I've got uh, the functions for calculating hand. But given that I took a lot of time on that, I'm going to just, uh, there were a few other slides which you can read if you like. So I'll just show the summary that 
really it's a, it's a web-based collaboration environment to enable rapid advances in hydrologic understanding by doing things like sharing and publishing data, social discovery, model sharing that supports collaboration, and then also model input preparation, model execution, and visualization of the results. And you saw some of those in the JupyterHub server environment that can actually run on high-performance computing systems.